Chapter 80 The Departure My goodness, Prince Zuko. Uncle chuckled a little as he returned Zuko's hug. This is certainly a more enthusiastic welcome than I expected. Face suddenly flaming, Zuko let go of Uncle and took a step back. What was he doing? He didn't hug people as a rule, and he couldn't remember the last time he'd done more than tolerate a hug from Uncle. Obviously, things had changed in the past several weeks, but if he kept this up, Uncle was going to think that he'd lost his mind. Before he could back away too much farther, Uncle rested a hand on his shoulder. I'm afraid I didn't recognize you at first, my nephew. I am pleased to see you looking so well. Zuko could say the same for Uncle. Or he could have if the words would come to him. As it was, he mostly just felt a wash of relief and warmth at the sight of Uncle, here and safe. Well, that and a bit of moisture on his cheeks. He swiped at them with his sleeve, hoping that no one else would notice. He was a mess. And as embarrassing as it was to have tears in his eyes over something like this, something good, he was too overwhelmed to do much about it. Getting good news just wasn't something that happened for him most of the time. And now that it had, Zuko wasn't quite sure what to do with himself. I'm okay, uncle. I told you I'd be fine, he managed. His throat was tight, and it took another second to find his voice again. I was starting to worry that you... Uncle shook his head. Your warnings were well received. Thank you. Zuko had to wipe his face with his sleeve again, and when he looked back up, he found Uncle peering past him. Avatar Katara, I believe that I must thank you and your friends for looking after my nephew since his arrival. I imagine things would have gone much differently had he not found you all. Zuko was half inclined to protest. He wasn't a child who needed to be looked after, and he was fairly certain that they were all relatively even on that front at the moment. But the words wouldn't seem to come. Instead, he looked back over his shoulder just far enough to see that all the others had risen and that Katara had advanced about halfway across the oasis, looking a bit uncertain. He gave her the best smile he could manage. Honestly, I'm a little glad it took you so long to get here, Katara said. At the beginning, we were all... Well, we had some differences to work out. I doubt you would have been quite as happy to see that part. Uncle chuckled. I imagine the reunion was quite a thing to behold. Yeah, I'm still mad that I didn't get to see that, Sokka said. It must have been hilarious. Zuko's face heated. Shut up, Sokka. Why should I, ponytail man? Sokka shot back. Yue raised an eyebrow at Sokka, and Aang shook his head before trotting forward after Katara. It's nice to actually meet you, General Iroh. I mean, after all those times we ran into each other on the way here and had to fight and stuff. Uncle bowed in response. I am pleased to officially meet you as well, Avatar Aang. And Sokka? And you as well, miss. Since Uncle seemed more than happy to busy himself with pleasantries and introductions, Zuko took a step to the side. His head was spinning a little from the abruptness of so many changes in so little time, and he wasn't sure that he could do more than watch and listen for a while. He inhaled deeply to steady himself. Sokka, unsurprisingly, managed to be an odd combination of suspicious and cheerful toward Uncle. Aang was blisteringly friendly, and Yue was as dignified as ever. All of it was normal. All of them were normal. Maybe Zuko just needed to get a grip on himself so that his head would stop spinning. You okay? Katara said softly, coming up beside him to give his arm a squeeze. He blinked. I, yeah, I'm fine. Why wouldn't I be? Katara laughed. You look like your head is going to explode. Oh, he shrugged. What if it does? She narrowed her eyes. Zuko. What? 
This is just... He looked around the oasis, at the ruined ground, the disrupted stones, all the evidence of how close they'd come to not surviving the battle. Then, in the middle of all of it, them. His uncle, his friends, somehow all still safe and whole. It's just a lot, that's all. You look terrified. Did he? Zuko couldn't actually tell which feelings were strongest at the moment. There were too many of them for him to recognize all at once. He was overwhelmed. That was the most fitting word he could find for it. But there was fear mixed in there somewhere, and as much as he wished that he could just push it away and be happy, and he was happy too, the icy fingers of doubt began to spread. Things were going well. Possibly a little too well, knowing his own luck. And the more he thought about it, the less comfortable he was with just accepting all of this. There were questions he needed to ask first. Uncle, what's going on? Zuko asked. How did you get here? I thought the fleet, or what's left of it, was heading back south. And how did you find us here? Isn't this place supposed to be secret or something? Yue frowned. Not, not entirely secret, but it is sacred. And since very few people visit, it isn't especially well known, even here in the city. She turned a wary look on Uncle. It isn't that you're unwelcome here, sir, but Zuko has a point. How did you manage to find us? Ah. Uncle folded his hands over his stomach. I suppose that is a good question. The fleet is still retreating, right? Sokka asked, angling a bit toward the pond, like he could protect the fish from Uncle if necessary. You're not here to finish Zhao's dirty work, are you? Uncle shook his head. Certainly not. I came to find my nephew, not for any other reason. And as for how I managed to find you all... As though on cue, the hatch opened again, and a tall, thin old man with long, wispy gray hair emerged into the oasis. The arrangements have been completed, General. If you're ready... Zuko's brow furrowed. He didn't think he'd ever seen the old man before, but his voice was familiar. He couldn't quite place it, but he knew that he'd heard it some time before. Master Paku! Katara exclaimed. I knew it! I knew you were acting suspicious! I knew that you were talking to the general somehow! Katara stormed up to Paku. Don't try to deny it! There's been something fishy going on for ages now. Paku narrowed his eyes down at her. I don't think you have much ground to stand on, young lady. He shot a pointed look past her at Zuko, then fixed her with a glare again. I knew that you and your friends would be involved in this some way or another. Involved in what? Sokka cut off when Zuko glared at him. Oh yeah, hiding Mr. Grumpy. That's fair. Halfway across the oasis, Zuko turned back to the general. Is that true, uncle? We figured out that you were talking to someone else up here, but that guy? Katara turned on Paku, too, arms crossed. And why didn't you tell us anything about what was going on? Wouldn't it have been helpful for everyone to know that you had inside information? Paku's scowl deepened. I was never able to ascertain anything more than what you and your friends shared with the council. My inside information was just as limited as yours. Another pointed look in Zuko's direction. And considering your source, very likely more limited. It's bold of you to accuse me of withholding information when you yourself were harboring a fugitive firebender within our city's walls. Any doubt that Katara had about her own rightness evaporated the instant that Paku called Zuko a fugitive. Sure, it wasn't an entirely inaccurate description, but if that was all Paku could see in Zuko, then she didn't care about his opinion. And she was glad that they hadn't gone to Paku for help, either. Working with him would have been a nightmare. She set her jaw. We told the council everything we knew except for the fact that Zuko was here. 
And I still don't think we were wrong. If this is how you're acting, then I really don't want to know what the rest of the tribe would have done to him. He risked his life to come here and help us. We weren't about to let him get killed over that. Had he come forward when he first arrived, the matter would have been far less serious then. What is that supposed to mean? Katara demanded, voice creeping upward. Don't try to pretend that you would have protected him. I remember how you lied and tried to convince me that there was a dangerous firebender on the loose. What was I supposed to do when that was what you thought of my friend? Paku froze and his expression darkened. Friend? Then it's worse than I thought. Katara, you must understand how irresponsible it is to place any real trust in someone from their blasted nation. They deserve nothing but suspicion. It came as something of a relief when Katara glanced toward the others and found Zuko too engrossed in conversation with his uncle to hear what Paku was saying about him. Still, her temper flared. She was the one who had the most experience with the Fire Nation. She actually knew Zuko. Paku couldn't say the same, and he didn't have any right to talk about Zuko that way. You brought the general here, she said sharply. Why do you get to criticize me for working with Zuko when you're helping out his uncle? Because I am not here to help General Iroh specifically. I am here for the good of my tribe, not the benefit of another nation. That's what you're calling it? And how is helping the people who made sure we knew the attack was coming not for the good of the tribe? Do you have any idea how much worse things could have been without them? Paku's glare remained steady and cold. I am aware, and that is why I intend to ensure their departure and nothing more. The sooner they leave us, the better. Katara's breath caught. Leave? Was that really what this was all about? Paku just wanted to get rid of Zuko and the general? She couldn't believe that. Stealing herself, she straightened her shoulders. We don't need your help for that. We have Appa right here. We were already planning to sneak Zuko back out of the city later this morning. His uncle doesn't change that plan. We'll just have to bring them supplies more often than we were planning on. You misunderstand me, Katara. They are leaving the North Pole, not just the city. The preparations are already made, and they will be out of our waters by this time tomorrow. But you can't do that! Paku frowned. Why shouldn't I? Because, her voice cut out, because she couldn't fathom the idea of asking Zuko to leave. She knew that he couldn't stay here in the city when Chief Arnuk was determined to hunt down any firebenders the fleet might have left behind, but she'd thought that they had a solution for that. They'd been hiding Zuko for so long now that the possibility of sending him away had never once occurred to her. He was her friend. How could they be separated now? Please, she said, her voice dropping to a near whisper. Her eyes began to prickle. Please, just give him a chance. There's no reason why he should have to leave now. Paku stared at her impassively. Please, Master Paku. He's been here for weeks, and you know he's only helped us. If you let him stay, I promise that I'll make sure there isn't any trouble. Paku kept staring, but his glare gradually shifted into a simple frown. It isn't entirely my decision to make. You might have already heard Chief Arnuk's thoughts on what is to be done with any firebenders found in our territory. Jaw tightening, Katara pulled her eyes away and tried her best to blink away the burning sensation. He couldn't be serious about this. There was no possible way. And General Iroh came to me specifically with the intention of finding his nephew and retreating to the Earth Kingdom by any means possible. He is well aware that the Chief intends to make an example of any survivors we can find here, young or old. She felt her brows furrow, and her gaze drifted over towards Zuko, still engrossed in the conversation on the far side of the oasis. How could anyone think that he was a real threat? His warm eyes, his messy hair, his earnest and thoughtful demeanor. Zuko was just a normal person, and surely anyone would see that at a glance. But, 
Chief Arnok will change his mind eventually. If he knows that Zuko is just a kid and that he's been helping us all along, then he has to. Do you know how many lives were lost in the fight? He has no such obligation, especially after losing his own chosen successor. Her throat went tight, and the burning around her eyes intensified. No. No, he can't. Arnok couldn't do anything that drastic. Certainly not for Han's sake. Could he? Paku reached across and very, very awkwardly patted her shoulder. That is why I've made arrangements for safe passage out of Water Tribe territory. So long as they move quickly, they should make it out safely. But... Her voice broke, and she pulled away from Paku's grasp with a little less force than she wanted to. There has to be another way. We still have a few hours. If you'll just give us a little time to think. There is no other way. If they choose to squander this opportunity, there will be nothing I can do to help them. Katara looked over at Zuko again. He was still listening while the general spoke, and judging by the solemnness in his expression, she could only guess that his uncle was explaining the same thing that Paku was telling her, likely in a much better way than Paku could. For just an instant, Zuko looked her way, and their gazes locked. There was something sad, something lonely and lost in his eyes, but he didn't seem distraught. He seemed calm, accepting, like somehow some part of him had been expecting this day to come, and the pain didn't hit quite as deeply because of that. There was an ache in the middle of her chest, but the steadiness in his gaze brought her back down to earth. Katara drew a long, steadying breath. Where is he supposed to go? She asked, just barely over a whisper. His own people want him dead. And he's a firebender. If he goes into the Earth Kingdom... Her voice cracked again. He's never going to be safe like this. Paku frowned. That is not my decision to make. General Iroh is here to retrieve his nephew and I assure you that if there is anyone in the world with the connections necessary to find the boy a safe home, it is the general. Katara's throat tightened again. I know, but... Paku raised an eyebrow. But? But Zuko was her friend. She cared about him. So much so that care didn't feel like a strong enough word. And even if Paku was right... Even if Zuko was okay with this, Katara didn't think that she could be. Just the thought of watching him leave made the horrible, aching emptiness in her chest start to grow. This wasn't fair. How was it that she already missed him when he was only a few dozen paces away? How long has this been going on, uncle? Zuko demanded. You're writing to people all over the world. And for what? How many people know what's going on right now? Uncle gave his arm what was probably meant to be a reassuring pat. It was never anything like that, Prince Zuko. I happen to have a great many ongoing pie show matches with friends and acquaintances all around the world. We exchange letters to keep the games moving, nothing more than that. It just happens that Master Paku is one of my pie show partners. Zuko pulled just a bit away from Uncle, slowly shaking his head. That's not true. I know it's not. He could feel Aang, Sokka, and Yue all standing close by, lingering in awkward silence as they apparently debated between continuing to listen and backing off to give Zuko and Uncle some privacy. Oddly, Zuko didn't really care either way. If anything, he felt a little emboldened with the others standing around him. Well, naturally, things have changed a bit recently, Uncle conceded. Once we arrived on Admiral Zhao's ship and I learned of our destination, my correspondence with Master Paku became a bit more pertinent. I met the healer, Uncle, Zuko retorted. I know that you brought me north right after. He couldn't bring himself to say it, but a vague gesture toward the left side of his face didn't leave much room for confusion. Uncle frowned. You did. Zuko nodded. 
just yesterday. Katara's has known about it for a while from working in the healing huts, and her teacher recognized me yesterday, so... He took a slow breath and set his jaw, still staring at Uncle. I know you've been talking with people outside the Fire Nation for a long time, and I know you're not just playing games by mail. I want to know what else you've been hiding from me. Ah. Uncle sighed and folded his hands over his stomach. It has never been my intention to deceive you, nephew. Still, Sokka said, kind of sounds like that's what happened, intentional or otherwise. Zuko couldn't decide whether he wanted to thank or punch Sokka. Probably both. He opted for ignoring him instead. There are things that I have, on occasion, been forced by circumstances to withhold, Uncle said evenly. In the past few years, it has not often been possible to turn to our own nation for assistance. And since there have been instances when we could not proceed without help, I have sometimes made use of my great list of acquaintances. For a few moments, Zuko couldn't respond. He wasn't sure how upset he was, or even how upset he should be. How many other friends had Uncle turned to over the years? What sorts of help had they given, and for what price? How many of them knew all about Zuko, and how many only knew who he'd been before the explosion? He exhaled. In a way, Zuko was grateful for the way that everything had gone so far. It had taken a while, but ultimately he'd found something that felt like safety. Something that felt like happiness. It wasn't what father would have wanted from him, but Zuko was fairly certain that he was doing the right thing now. He liked himself better now than he had in a very long time. But how much of that had been his own choice? How many times had uncle and his friends either pushed Zuko forward or pulled him back to get where he was now? How proud of himself could Zuko really be if uncle had been steering him all along? Prince Zuko Zuko shook his head, brow furrowing. You didn't trust me, did you? Uncle frowned. It is not a matter of trust. There was always some information that would have been unwise or unsafe to share with anyone. I hoped to protect you above everything else. Zuko shook his head again. Protecting me from what? From knowing what was going on? If you couldn't tell me the truth, you must not have trusted me to make the right choices on my own. All this time you've been trying to push me, and... I have tried to leave our paths in your hands, Prince Zuko, Uncle replied quietly. Perhaps I didn't succeed, but I didn't wish to taint your decisions by sharing my less conventional connections. The sour feeling in his stomach hadn't subsided. If anything, it was worse. You hid things from me. His voice felt small and ragged. Uncle, don't you realize how much harder it was not knowing that... Zuko cut himself off and looked sharply downward. How much had Uncle known? If he'd realized how willing Father was to order Zuko's death, then Uncle had watched Zuko tear himself apart over his mission for nearly three years, all for nothing. Maybe if Uncle had told him that earlier... Zuko could have reached this point sooner. Maybe he could have been okay with himself and his choices ages ago. This time, when Uncle closed the gap, there was nowhere else for Zuko to back up unless he wanted to skid in the mud and slide back into the pond. I am sorry, nephew, Uncle said, his expression solemn and sincere. His broad hand clasped Zuko by the shoulder. It was never my intention to deceive you. But in any case, you have come a long way without my help. I am proud of you, Prince Zuko. He felt his forehead crease. You're not... You're not ashamed about... He gestured around them. Everything? Patting his shoulder, Uncle shook his head. No. Unless I have been badly misled about your time here, I see no reason whatsoever for shame. Zuko let out a slow breath. His shoulders felt lighter, much lighter than before. He glanced toward where Katara stood, deep in conversation with Master Paku, 
and she met his eyes for an instant. Although she didn't look happy at the moment, something inside him warmed. I... I had a lot of help. With a smile, Uncle looked back at the others. And I owe all of you many thanks for that. Zuko's mouth compressed into a thin line. I do still have questions, Uncle. Lots of them. I am sure that you do. Perhaps we might. General, Master Paku called across the oasis. Time is running out. Of course, Uncle called back. Thank you, Master Paku. He faced the others briefly. I must thank you all again for all you have done to assist my nephew. I am forever grateful that I have had the opportunity to meet you in person. With that, he turned to Zuko again. It is time to go, nephew. Zuko's brow furrowed. There was a finality in Uncle's tone that he didn't like. To go where? To tell the truth, I am not certain. It is my understanding that Master Paku has made some arrangements. Uncertainty settled over him, and Zuko caught a few confused looks from Sokka, Yue, and Aang. Arrangements? Had Paku somehow beaten them all to the idea of setting up a hidden camp somewhere outside the city? Or was it something else? Was Paku leading them to the chief after all? Maybe Yue had been mistaken, and for some reason, Katara's old prune of a teacher had enough influence to win them a place here. Or maybe it was worse than that. Maybe Paku was planning to turn them over, knowing full well that the chief planned to have them killed. But Uncle seemed to know what was going on, and he didn't seem particularly worried. Whatever it was couldn't be terrible, right? Regardless, it didn't seem like Zuko had much choice but to follow. We are at your disposal, Master Paku, Uncle said calmly. Paku looked at them both for a moment before he nodded and motioned toward the hatch. Come along, then. Zuko glanced at Katara, and she met his eyes. Then, before he could decipher the look in her eyes or ask whether she knew what was going on, she grabbed onto his hand. Katara, Paku said sharply. You should stay here with the others. Her grip on Zuko's hand tightened. No. Katara. Just try and stop me, she practically snarled. Katara could feel Zuko's gaze on the side of her face as they trailed behind the pair of old men. It was hard to look back at him. Her throat was tight, and it felt very much like she would cry if she met his eyes again. This wasn't fair. Everything felt far too abrupt, far too fast. They should have had more time than this. Maybe if they had a few more days together, she could get used to the idea of him leaving. Maybe they could say a proper goodbye and plan for a place and a time to meet up again in the Earth Kingdom. Maybe she could even smile as she waved him off if she had a few days to adjust to the idea. Who was she kidding? A few days wouldn't be enough. A few weeks wouldn't either. If she were honest with herself, she didn't think that there could be enough time in the world to prepare her for losing him. Zuko remained quiet until they'd entered a dim tunnel near the outer wall and lagged several steps behind the general and Paku. His hand brushed softly against her shoulder. Hey, is... is there something wrong? Her breath rushed out all at once, and the prickling in her eyes worsened. Yes, of course there is! What? He stopped short in the middle of the tunnel and turned to face her. Katara, what do you... He broke off, brows furrowing. Did I do something wrong? What? She had no choice but to look up into his eyes. No, it's not. Then what is it? His hand hovered up toward her face. Are you, are you crying? She swiped her sleeve across her face. Maybe. I don't know. Katara. How 
are you so calm? She burst out. Though Zuko's forehead was creased, he didn't seem upset. He just seemed concerned and bewildered, like there was something odd about her reaction to his impending departure. Did you know this was coming? What are you talking about? What's coming? Her breath caught, and she shot a look at Paku and the general, both of whom had stopped near the far end of the tunnel when the voices reached them. Paku wore the same stern expression as always, and the general just looked sad. Master Paku told me... She couldn't bring herself to finish the sentence. Instead, she asked, Didn't your uncle say anything? I... Zuko swallowed visibly and shook his head. I don't think so. He just told me... He just explains a little about the letters with Paku. And everyone else he's been writing to for the past three years. Her chest tightened. This isn't fair. She shouldn't have to tell Zuko. She didn't want him to leave. What's not? He broke off, then turned toward his uncle, holding Katara's hand tighter than ever. Uncle, what's going on? What aren't you telling me? His breath began to come in sharp, short bursts. If it was easier to convince herself to move, Katara would have hugged him. She recognized the growing terror in his eyes, and there was nothing she could say to make it better. The general took a step toward Zuko, hands extending in a placating gesture. Please, nephew, we are still quite near the city. If this can only wait until we are further from earshot, then I will explain everything. No. Zuko took a small step back, angling closer to Katara, his face contorting with pain and confusion. I'm tired of being lied to. Just tell me where you're taking me. The general cleared his throat and spent a moment fixing the sleeves of his robes before he met Zuko's gaze again. My understanding is that we are headed toward the fisherman's docks. And? Zuko pressed, voice taut. Katara couldn't help herself. She leaned in closer to him and gripped his arm with her free hand. When was the next time she would get to do this? To just stand beside him with the assurance that they were together and he was safe. It hurt to think about it too much. The general cleared his throat again. Avatar Katara, perhaps it would be best if you returned to your friends. I believe that I should speak to my nephew privately. She shook her head. No. No, she had to stay. If nothing else, she needed a proper chance to... to say goodbye. It wasn't fair. It had only been a few weeks, but they'd come so far together in that time that they ought to have a say in this. There should be some other option, for Zuko's sake, if nothing else. Sure, he hadn't always been safe up here, but she knew him well enough to understand how much happier he'd been. How much warmer and more open he allowed himself to be here. And now, that was being torn away again. It seemed cruel. Horribly cruel. I'm not going anywhere, she said. If you need to talk in private, that's fine. But I'm not leaving. Not yet. Not unless the impossible happened and the two old men decided that Zuko could stay with her. Or, more likely until she'd said her goodbye and she had no other choice but to leave. The general sighed. Very well. Prince Zuko, would you perhaps join me for just a moment? You'll be leaving the North Pole, Paku interrupted sharply. Now quit wasting time. If you don't set off soon, the guards will find you both, and I will not be held responsible for what happens when they do. Zuko's breath caught audibly in his throat. Where? Uncle? Is that? The general shot a glare at Paku, but then nodded solemnly. Yes. Unfortunately, we are not entirely welcome in the North Pole. After all that has happened, I'm sure you can understand why the people of the Water Tribe might be less than eager to accept firebenders into their midst. Zuko shook his head slightly, 
so slightly that it appeared almost involuntary. But no. No, uncle. I helped. I fought to help the water tribe. I know, nephew. And, and you helped too. You gave us information. Princess Yue knows about all of it, and the others agreed to hide us until they managed to convince the chief that... The general shook his head sadly. I wish it were that simple. Why can't it be? Zuko asked, his tone creeping ever closer to frantic. We're not enemies here. There are people who could vouch for us. They promised that they would. Paku scoffed. When word gets out that your little outlaw troop has been harboring a firebender in our territory for weeks, there is nothing that they will be able to say to influence anything. Even Princess Yue couldn't stop her own engagement. Now that we have lost so many in battle, there is nothing that anyone could say to delay your execution. Her throat tightened so badly that it was difficult to swallow, and when Zuko looked down at her, it only got worse. Maybe they should have told Chief Arnuk the whole truth from the start. Maybe if they had, they could be welcoming the general as a new guest rather than driving them both away. Or maybe it would have been worse. Maybe Zuko would have been a prisoner for all this time. Maybe they never would have gotten close. Never would have become friends in the first place. Maybe the parting wouldn't have hurt so badly, but it would have come at the cost of all their soft, shining moments together. Or maybe Zuko wouldn't have survived at all. Then... Zuko's voice was tight and strangled. Then we can all leave together, right? Please. Under no circumstances will you be taking Katara along with you, Paku snapped. Quite apart from the fact that she has not finished her training yet, I know better than to trust a hot-headed child with something half so important. But I did everything I could to protect her, and... And, Paku interrupted, there are scarcely enough provisions for two. I cannot work miracles, young man. She heard Zuko's breath catch again, and when she looked back up at him, he looked like he'd been kicked in the stomach. The general took a far softer tone than Paku had. Nothing would please me more than a large traveling party. Avatar Katara, your friends seem delightful, and I do hope that we may become better acquainted. Unfortunately, it seems that we have once again met under rather poor circumstances. Perhaps one day in the future. The future? There was a harsh, brittle edge to Zuko's voice. What future, uncle? I'm not welcome anywhere I go. Father wants me dead, and I can count the number of people who don't agree with him on my hands. I don't have a future. Prince Zuko, I understand that it may seem hopeless right now, but... When the general reached for his shoulder, Zuko wrenched away, pulling free from Katara's grasp, too. There is no but. This is the first place I've ever been able to make a real difference. And if these people want me dead, too, then I'm... Zuko? Katara said, her voice quaking ever so slightly. It hurt. It hurt seeing him like this, swept up in despair and uncertainty for the future much like it had hurt to watch the other day when he'd been so engulfed by thoughts of his past. The problem was that this time, she wasn't sure whether she could fix things, whether she could even help. If only he could stay somehow. She knew that they could find a way to make things work. She knew that he could have a place to belong, a purpose to pursue. He would find his way with help. She trusted him with that. But if he couldn't stay, nothing was certain anymore. He looked at her again, and the pain, the anguish seemed close to overflowing. There is always hope, the general said quietly. Please, Prince Zuko, we must go. Zuko looked away, eyes fixed on nothing, and shook his head almost involuntarily again. This time, however, when his uncle reached toward him, Zuko didn't just pull back. This time, he bolted. Zuko! Katara called, 
her voice breaking mid-word. The general shot an apologetic look back at Paku. I am sorry, Master Paku. It may take a bit longer than I anticipated, too. That was all that Katara heard. By the time that Zuko made it out through the archway and into the street, she was already sprinting after him as fast as her legs could go. It didn't take long to catch up with him. There was a stairway leading up the side of the city wall just a few dozen paces away from the mouth of the tunnel, and Zuko had stopped there, dropping down on one of the steps. His head rested in his hands, and his shoulders shook. Katara's boots made a slight crunch in the snow, and she had to stop, eyes burning. I can't do this, Zuko said, each word sounding faint and choked. I can't. Zuko, she said again. It was the only thing she could think of. There were no reassurances, no comforting words that she could offer him. She could barely even speak. His head raised just a tiny bit, and he drew in a sharp, shuddering breath. I don't want to leave. Can't, can't Uncle see that? He wiped his eyes with his sleeve, and his shoulders shook even more forcefully than before. I don't want to go. I... Her throat burned, and she had to stop to regain control over her voice as she wiped at her eyes as well. What choice did she have? Paku knew about him now. Even if she wanted to keep Zuko here, to keep him hidden and safe somewhere near the city... All it would take was a word from Paku to bring everything crashing down. I think you should. His head snapped upward and his eyes locked with hers. You... you do? His forehead creased and the wave of pain that washed over his face was so palpable that she could feel it in her chest from several paces away. She swallowed hard, but the tears wouldn't stop. I don't want you to leave. I just... She came a little closer before her knees buckled, and she ended up crouched in the snow just out of arm's reach. I can't lose you. Not like this. Then I'll stay. He slid a little farther forward. There's a way, right? There's always a way. We can make this work. It took a surprising amount of effort to shake her head. I think... I think that leaving is the only way. Tears streaming, Zuko shook his head. No, it can't be. Katara, this is your... She reached out as far as she could and grabbed hold of his hand, clinging to it with everything she had. I'm going to lose you either way, Zuko. And if you try to stay here, I can't watch my best friend die. There's no way. If I have to lose you, then I at least need to know that you're safe. For a little while, Zuko just looked at her, brows drawn and forehead creased. Then he swiped at his face with the heel of his hand. Can't I just be happy for a few more days? If I leave here, someone will probably kill me anyway sooner or later. No one out there. No one cares about me. At least if I stay, maybe I won't have to be miserable for the rest of my life. She took a deep, shuddering breath before sliding closer to him. Her hand trembled just the smallest bit before cupping softly around his cheek. But I can't stand by and watch that happen to you. You mean too much to me. His eyes closed, and although she half expected him to pull away, he didn't. Instead, he remained perfectly, impossibly still for the length of a few heartbeats. Finally, though, he opened his eyes. You can't mean that. A soft flick landed in the middle of his forehead. Of course I mean it. Zuko, I can't just sit here and wait for you to be captured and killed. I need to know that there's still a chance that I can find you again. When he didn't respond, she cupped his cheek again, tilting his face ever so slightly upward until his eyes locked with hers. If you were in my place, what would you do? I... He swallowed visibly. 
That's different. How? Because, because you have people who love you. You've got things to fight for. But I... Katara cut herself off. Zuko's forehead creased. Katara. She shook her head. The words felt too big, too heavy for her to finish the sentence. Did she? Did she really love him? What did that even mean if she did? With a shuddering exhalation, she wiped her eyes again. There wasn't time to think about that right now. She didn't have the luxury of taking the hours, the days that she would need to sort through her feelings. Not now. Not when the general was probably mere minutes away from coming to look for them, to lead Zuko off and out of her life. In fact, figuring things out might actually make it worse. On an impulse, Katara reached back and pulled out the pins that held her loops of hair in place. Carefully, deliberately, she removed the beads from near her temples and allowed them to drop into the palm of her hand as the now loose locks fell to either side of her face. Zuko stared. What are you? She pulled his hand closer, tipped the beads out, and pressed his hand shut around them before she met his eyes again. I'm giving you something to fight for. His brow furrowed, and he looked down. Please, Zuko. If you go with your uncle now, I promise that I'll come looking for you as soon as I can. This doesn't have to be the last time we see each other. And when we find each other again... I can give them back. Pressing her lips together, she shrugged. Only if you want to. I just want you to keep them safe. And, much more importantly, to keep himself safe. Zuko took a long, shaking breath. I don't want to leave. Her hands tightened around his. I've never... I've never had people who cared about me outside of Uncle. And my... He swallowed and shook his head. I don't want to go back to the way things used to be. I don't want... His voice broke. Katara leaned forward and buried her face into his shoulder. I care about you, Zuko. No matter where you are, I'll still care. He'd begun shaking again, but he hugged her back. I just... I want more time. It felt as though she should have run out of tears, but they began to flow faster as she tightened her arms around him. Me too, but I don't think it's ever going to be enough. Zuko wasn't sure how he made it to the docks, much less onto the raft. He was numb, utterly, impossibly numb. He thought that he walked there on his own, he was fairly certain that Katara had held his hand all the way to the docks, and he knew that she'd pushed Master Paku away when the old man tried to guide her back into the city before the raft was out of sight. That much was clear. But everything else? It was foggy at best. All he knew for certain was that it hurt. That he'd finally given in to all the cajoling, the soft, desperate pleas. And now he couldn't tell which of the patches of blue to the north was Katara, if any of them were. For all he knew, he was staring back at a lump of ice and desperately, stupidly hoping that something might change. That somehow, he might wake up back in the oasis again, and this time, things might end differently. They wouldn't. He knew that. Zuko had never been the brightest child. But even he couldn't delude himself about this. His glimpse of what could have been a life of happiness and normalcy, or the nearest thing to happiness and normalcy that he could probably hope for, had shattered and it wasn't coming back. Still, he couldn't pull his eyes away from the increasingly distant city walls. He felt like he was in a trance. Like he couldn't look away even when Uncle steered the raft down a different channel and a tall, cloudy turquoise iceberg blocked the city from view. 
It felt like what little hope, what little control he had left would dissolve the second that he dared to pull away. He couldn't face the future. Not yet. Zuko was vaguely aware that Uncle was speaking to him, but not a single word registered. He thought back to the ice pit in the middle of the lake, to how the others had gradually brought him more supplies until he had a somewhat comfortable little camp down there. He thought about how all of it, his belongings, along with all the others' contributions, had been swept away in moments when the waterbenders drained the lake. He remembered how lost he'd felt for a while, how he'd half convinced himself that he would have to resort to hiding in the tunnels under the city unless he could somehow pry his things out of the ice. How, instead of asking him to do any of that, the others had banded together to build a new camp on the ridge overlooking the city. How had he let himself get used to that? To any of it? To feeling like he had a home? Like he had friends? He should have known better than to believe that anything so good could last. He should have known that he couldn't really belong anywhere, no matter how good it might feel for the few days or weeks that it lasted. That didn't make it hurt any less. His home had been a tent, his friends had been a confusing jumble of often infuriating oddballs, and now that they were all gone, all he could feel was a raw, aching emptiness in the middle of his chest. He had uncle, and aside from that, there was nothing. He thought he even missed Frogface somehow. He couldn't be sure of how far they'd gone. The sun was high enough that it hurt to look too directly at the snow and ice around them, when a soft, heavy hand rested on his shoulder. Prince Zuko, I believe that we are nearly... Zuko jerked back into reality and wrenched himself out of Uncle's reach. Just as he'd feared, turning away from the city, moving at all, just made the pain and the emptiness worse. He was alone just as alone as he'd been for the first years of his banishment, but this time felt so much worse. This time, the echoes of warmth and affection and closeness were still fresh enough that he could feel their absence. You look unwell, nephew. Is there anything wrong? Zuko's voice came without his bidding, powered by a swell of uncontrollable agony. Of course there's something wrong, uncle! Did you just notice that? Uncle folded his hands together and gave him a somber, steady look. Of course not. I have been trying to get your attention for some time now. This is simply the first time you've responded. Well, maybe that's because I don't want to talk about this. Uncle allowed a moment of silence to pass before he spoke again. If there is anything that I can do... You can stop giving me advice that I never asked for, Zuko roared. He couldn't stop himself. He couldn't even manage to lower his voice. If it would help, I can certainly try. Another pause. May I ask which piece of advice is troubling you? You're always telling me that I should make friends, saying that it would be good for me. Uncle gave a small nod. And I still believe that. I made friends, uncle. And I don't... I don't see the point in having friends when it hurts this much to leave them behind. His voice cracked on nearly every word, and he could feel his shoulders convulsing with the sharp, gasping breaths. His hands clenched so tight around the little blue ivory beads that Katara had given him that he was half convinced that they would sink straight into his skin. Prince Zuko, Uncle said, voice soft. Zuko pulled away again, but there was nowhere to turn. He made it just a few steps toward the other side of the raft before he dropped down, burying his head in his hands. You never told me that I would have to leave. There was a considerable pause before Uncle approached. A hand rested on Zuko's shoulder again. But this time, Uncle pulled him in against his soft, round side. I am sorry, nephew. I am so sorry. Surely, sooner or later, Zuko would run out of strength. 
Sooner or later, the crying would empty out what was left inside of him, and the husk that remained would have no more tears, no more emotions, nothing. Sooner or later, it had to stop hurting. For some reason, that time refused to come. For what felt like a long time, Uncle let Zuko rest against his shoulder, patting his back like he was a little boy again. Like there was something normal about Zuko crumpling in on himself, falling apart because he couldn't manage to hold himself together anymore. Like it wasn't shameful to have so little control over his own feelings. Someday, Prince Zuko, Uncle said quietly, someday I promise you that the pain will fade. Someday you will be able to remember the good times without the sorrow dulling their glow. And... At long last, he pushed Zuko far enough back to meet his eyes. If I know anything at all about Avatar Katara, we will see her again someday.